My name is James Orr. I work at the Laboratoire des Sciences du Climat et de l'Environnement in Paris. Uh, today I will be talking about ocean acidification, which is uh, the impact of uh, the CO2 absorption in the ocean, because CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing, the impact of that on the chemistry, uh, the fact that pH will be declining, for instance, and also the, the, the impacts of that chemical change on marine organisms. Well, thank you um, very much. First of all, thanks, thanks to Carlo Lage and the, the other members of the GIFT committee for inviting me. I've heard great things about the GIFT workshops over the years, knowing Carlo for two decades now. Uh, and um, he finally invited me to attend, so uh, this, is, this is great. Uh, as I just mentioned before, uh, I'll be talking about kind of the other side of, of this absorption of CO2 by the ocean. Uh, I'm really happy to have a chance to talk to you as teachers. I feel very close to you. My children right now are learning from your colleagues in France about science, about ocean acidification and climate change and other things. Uh, and I also come to the high schools occasionally and talk about ocean acidification. I find that it's quite uh, attractive to the students. They somehow get attached to this very quickly. They understand the concepts. It's quite basic, actually, the chemistry anyway. And uh, some go off and do experiments as for class projects. I think the French high school students, well, about 10 years ago when I wrote a paper uh, on this subject, I was contacted by some French high school students. And, and I think they were the first ones to just do a very simple experiment where you actually just take take a straw, blow into a, a flask and measure the pH and you can actually see a change in pH of a few tenths of a pH unit just because the CO2 in the air we breathe is at about 4%, which is maybe 100 times more than what we find in the atmosphere right now. So you can actually see it, uh, a very cha a change over less than a minute. Uh, so that's quite a... And you had a lot of other hands-on experiments yesterday on ocean acidification. I won't be dealing with this more hands-on approach. I'll be trying to supply you with some information that I hope that you can take back to your schools and and teach, teach the children uh, about ocean acidification. Uh, first of all, ocean acidification can be caused by various factors, uh, especially when we're near coastlines. There can be, co there can be point sources of, of, well, emissions of acid gases. The acid, an acid gas is basically when you add a gas to water, it makes an acid, right? So, anything with NOx or SOx type of gases. It can also be due to fertilizer runoff, which causes eutrophication, and then degradation of organic matter, which also produces uh, lower pH. Okay, so this is, there are a lot of, uh, several factors of acidification, but the big factor is not that. The big factor, which covers everything, uh, is global in phenomena, which Laurent mentioned. CO2 is relatively homogeneous in the atmosphere. It's invading the ocean everywhere. Uh, this is another look at the global carbon cycle. Fortunately, with Laurent, Bob's great presentation, I don't have to really say a word other than that the atmosphere, is, as Laurent mentioned, is increasing in CO2. Uh, half of the CO2 is remaining there, and the other, the other half is split equally pretty much between the land and the ocean. Uh, the, the half of the half, one quarter of the CO2 that's being absorbed by the ocean, is actually quite a lot of CO2. Uh, it's 24 million tons of CO2 every day, uh, and we'll get down to exactly what that means per person in just a moment. Uh, it's a weak acid, but there's so much going into the ocean that it's having an effect on the chemistry, which in turn is having an effect on the ocean, ocean biological organisms. So here's a quick look. Here's a, I want to give you two looks at chemistry. For those of you in chemistry class, uh, they're teaching chemistry and you want to get into more details, you have to wait for the next slide. But this one is basically uh, a very simple way to present CO2. It's just a, a gas. It's being absorbed by the ocean. It's hydrophilic. CO2 is, uh, it loves water, right? And so there's a lot of CO2 in the ocean, unlike other gases. Most of the CO2 is in the ocean. It mixes with water and it makes carbonic acid. And that, that acid dissociates, producing protons. And, uh, but this is basically, you see, we're producing an acid by CO2 being absorbed by the ocean. It's an acid gas. I already mentioned what that, that means. Uh, each of us adds four kilograms of CO2 per day to the ocean. Four kilograms per day. Man, woman, child. On the planet, that's the average. Okay? Of course, being from developed countries, which most of our, us are, if you count for our emissions, it's a lot more than four kilograms of CO2 per day, right? That's like 
everyone throwing a bowling ball of carbon dioxide into the, into the sea every day. Uh, so it's quite a lot of CO2, and we can imagine that that does have an effect on the chemistry. Uh, the acidity of the ocean, uh, we'll talk about what that means in a moment, but not, let's not get into pH yet, but just the acidity, which is actually the hydrogen ion concentration, has increased by about 26% since the beginning of the industrial era, following very closely the CO2 increase. And that's in the surface ocean. Most of that change has occurred in the last decades. Uh, half, half or so has occurred in the last 30, 40 years. Acidity, um, increase could be much larger than that if we continue to emit CO2, which we undoubtedly will do. And it's just a question of how high will we get. It could get up to 170% higher relative to pre-industrial in terms of hydrogen ion concentration by the end of the end of this century under the business as usual IPCC scenario, RCP 8.5. So this is the next step. If we go in a little more into the chemistry, I know maybe some of you are shuddering already if you're not teaching chemistry classes, but uh, I'm not going to get in any more chemical equations. This is it. It's basically CO2 is a diprotic acid, so basically it mixes with water, and the first reaction we can call it the K1 here. Uh, this basically just releases a proton and bicarbonate ion. That, and then that bicarbonate ion also dissociates in K2, producing a carbonate ion and another proton. So, but if you sum these two up, if you kind of switch around this K2, this is basically what's happening in the ocean, that CO2 is, is combining with water, making, uh, making this acid, but it's, it's combining with a base, if you will. You can call it an antacid for students who aren't really into acid-base chemistry. It's actually a conjugate base of a weak acid. Yeah. So this is very prominent in the ocean, carbonate ion. This is a major reason why the ocean absorbs CO2 in the first place, it's chemically disposed much more than fresh water to absorb CO2 because there's so much carbonate ion in, in seawater. What's interesting about this equation, just from Le Chatelier's principle, you can see if you increase CO2, you're going to reduce carbonate ion concentration and produce bicarbonate ion concentration. So CO2 in the seawater is following the atmosphere. This is just dissolved aqueous CO2. And the carbonate ion is just a mirror image of that. This is over time from, from pre-industrial 1850 until the end of this century, 2100, on a pH. The pH is on this side, but you probably have a hard time seeing the numbers. But just to get the idea, uh, this carbonate ion is a mirror image. So, so the capacity of the ocean, the chemical capacity of the ocean is actually to absorb CO2 is actually being reduced by putting more CO2 into the ocean itself. And this is in the surface ocean. Lombard mentioned that, that it takes a long time for the surface ocean to mix with the deep reservoirs, which have a lot more carbonate ion. But over the next decades, centuries, the capacity of the ocean to absorb CO2 will be reduced substantially uh, because, chemically speaking, um, because of this simple chemistry, the simple effect. Uh, we already mentioned the ocean absorbs one quarter of the anthropogenic CO2 currently. CO2 is an acid gas and ocean acidity has increased. And if you really want to get into combining chemistry and math in your classes, it's not hard. It's just a little bit of algebra, but you can actually show that the hydrogen ion is increased, which isn't apparent here. There's no hydrogen ion coming out in this, this equation, which is kind of uh, misleading. But hydrogen ion is also increasing. It's, if you increase the CO2, and because that means carbonate ion is decreasing, by definition, hydrogen ion is also increasing. And as I mentioned, it's increasing perhaps by up to 170% by the end of the century. So that's, that's quite a lot. Okay, we're done with the chemistry. Now we can go on to more fun things, I suppose. Change in pH. Um, the pH is changing. We know that just from basic theory, just from these equations, we can calculate that change because CO2 in the surface falls in the surface ocean follows so well CO2 in the atmosphere, we don't even need a model. We can calculate that change with just thermodynamics that we know quite well. But we can also measure it. We can also measure the change in pH as CO2. These are measurements made at three different stations uh, in the Atlantic, two in the Atlantic, one in the Pacific, all in the subtropical gyre regions. Uh, and the, the longest station is extended now for 30 years. It started actually in 1983 at Bat. Oh goodness! It's starting at, at Bats uh, in the Atlantic. This station here, okay, not far from UMass, actually at Bermuda. Uh, and this black curve on top is the Mauna Loa curve, this Keeling curve. 
we don't show the full length of the curve, but over the duration of the time series in the ocean, you can see these oscillations, which we saw before, but the oscillations in the ocean are much larger at every station. And so getting the trend out of that, it takes, you could say it longer, if you get a robust trend out of this, this, uh, this curve, it takes longer, of course. But we do have, in all cases, the CO2 in the ocean is following, basically, the atmosphere very well at all three stations. Uh, and that means that the pH is declining for the, chemo for the reasons we've already talked about, but also the carbonate ion concentration is declining. The capacity of the ocean to take up CO2 uh, is declining at these stations. And we'll talk a little more about carbonate ion in terms of what it means for biology also. Uh, now, let's put that in context a little bit. Uh, here is what we're seeing over the, over the full industrial period from 1900, well, almost the full industrial period, from from 1900 to 2100, we see that CO2, this light blue curve, is increasing. pH is going down, this mirror image effect. These are the oscillations over the last 800,000 years uh, between glacial and interglacial periods between about 180 uh, ppm CO2 in the atmosphere to 280 to 300 ppm in the atmosphere. Uh, very close, very very nice, beautiful data, lots of, lots of numbers from the ice cores, which you've heard about already uh, at this meeting. Uh, this seems like, yeah, okay, it's different, but this, is, this time scale here is actually four, it's a zoom by a factor of 4,000, so it's really, uh, if we put it on the same time scale, if we, if we looked at, well, we'll look at that in a second, but uh, in any case, the, the anthropogenic change has overwhelmed uh, the natural variations, which we've seen actually starting off in the pre-industrial period already at a high level relative to the glacial interglacial oscillations. It's gone up by uh, more than another 100 ppm already, and in a time much faster than anything we've seen over this time period, but probably over the last 55 million years, at least even 55 million years ago, uh, probably it was 10 times faster than natural. That natural event. Uh, it probably is unprecedented for at least 300 million years. We, it's hard going back <laughs> much further than that. Uh, and so, but now let's put it on the uh, uh, constricted time scale where everything's on the same, same time scale. We see, obviously, there's a spike here. This is just, this is just us. This is the anthropogenic effect. Okay, we, we've just shot up uh, if you put it on the same time scale. So this is CO2 over the same, the same CO2 data over the last 800,000 years. Uh, another fact that Luo mentioned was that the emissions right now are tracking the high-end scenarios, the, the IPCC scenarios, which you've heard about already. Uh, that doesn't mean they will in the future, but uh, we're certainly not doing much about it right now. Uh, so this is obviously a concern that we can expect that maybe pH or the hydrogen ion concentration, the acidity of the ocean will increase by 170% by, by the end of the century. This is hopefully not, but uh, who knows. Uh, so the projected future pH is, of course, dependent exactly on the scenario that we're using. The high-end scenarios, higher CO2 means, uh, means lower pH, uh, more hydrogen ion, more, more acidity. Uh, and here is just the effect of the CO2, which you've already seen from the different scenarios between the, the low scenario, RCP 2.6 is probably uh, quite optimistic, indeed probably implying actually removal of CO2 from the atmosphere uh, if we would hope to attain this by, by the end of the century, below even a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere relative to the natural level, and much higher values, 936 ppm. You know, a lot of plots, they stop in 2100, and I haven't gone beyond that, but, but this RCP uh, 8.5 scenario, it continues to, to rise, and then by, by the 23rd century, it's already up to twice this amount here, so 1800 ppm in the atmosphere, so that implies much worse and something we don't want to think about, but yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so big differences in terms of pH. It's, no, it's not pH, but it's the carbonate ion concentration uh, relative to a critical level, just the ratio, if you will. When this ratio goes below one, uh, basically the waters become corrosive to uh, the mineral that is indicated. This critical concentration depends on the mineral. One of the carbonate, car one of the carbonate minerals in the ocean, which is very important, uh, is aragonite. There's two forms of calcium carbonate pure forms uh, in the ocean, aragonite and calcite, and this is for the less stable, metastable form. And some organisms actually secrete this mineral in their shell. So when the waters would become undersaturated 
that means corrosive to this mineral, then we could expect as chemists that this would dissolve. Well, biology, of course, may, the organisms may have some strategies uh, in place already, such as covering uh, of their skeletal material with, with membrane, but it's not the case for all organisms. Uh, so we see, this is animation from model simulations uh, over the 21st century and how we're replaying this repeatedly, but you see how the waters are becoming red in the higher, higher latitudes in the polar regions first, particularly in, in the Arctic, uh, and in increasing in intensity. At the very end of the simulation, you'll see also uh, the subarctic Pacific becoming undersaturated, even spots of undersaturated coming further south. If, if I would play this out another, with the high-end scenario, another, a few further centuries, even places like the Great Barrier Reef start to become undersaturated. This is the largest living organism that we can see from space. Uh, and so this is quite worrisome because corals on the Great Barrier Reefs actually secrete aragonite. There are also organisms uh, in the high latitudes which, which secrete aragonite, which we'll talk about also in a moment. So uh, very simple chemical calculations, but striking in how things are changing. What's striking most is the red areas that we're seeing here, but also notice in the, in the tropical regions, there are reductions. The blue is becoming less blue. So there's reductions everywhere. CO2 is invading the ocean everywhere. So if we just look at the tropics now, the study came out in 2013 uh, showing that uh, corals, well, if you just look at the chemistry of corals, it, it, it is a bit worrisome because we think that corals have a, a threshold. We're not exactly sure where that is, but we know it's probably at least 300% uh, more than this saturation level of one. This is what this omega A is here. And this is in current, current um, atmospheric CO2, this saturation state. Most of the corals are in waters which are above this but it's still already less than the pre-industrial. And then as we go even just to a doubling of atmospheric CO2, which perhaps is unavoidable, I don't know, but uh, most of the corals by far have become under this threshold level, so may become un unsustainable. Just thinking as a chemist, that's my background mainly, but biology is unfortunately more complex than that. Uh, but uh, chemically, there's big changes over this century everywhere in the surface ocean. Um, there's also changes in the deeper ocean. This is just, if we just look at the present state of the ocean in the same, the same uh, um, value here of, for the saturation state, every, everywhere in the surface ocean where it's red and yellow, it's, it's super saturated above this value of one. Uh, and everywhere where it's blue down below here uh, is actually undersaturated. This, is, this line is actually called the aragonite saturation horizon above Everything supersaturated below undersaturated. With time, if we just fast forward to the end of the century, take a quick glimpse here, particularly what's going down to 3,000 meters in the Atlantic. This is just uh, an average section for the Atlantic uh, from the south, south Pole to the North Pole. Uh, so going up, just taking the average of all the waters in the Atlantic, going from the surface down to 3,000 meters. Let's take a look at what it looks like. This is what it looks like now, and in 2100, Suddenly things have changed an awful lot. We already saw this in the surface. What's happened in the Southern Ocean? Well, it used to be down here, this red zone, but now it's already come all the way up to the surface. In the Atlantic, it was down to nearly 3,000 meters. It's come to within 200 meters of the surface. So big changes, not only at the surface, but also in the deep ocean. Waters have all become undersaturated over time. Pacific, the same, pretty much the same kinds of changes in the Southern Ocean, but much, much lower changes in the North, uh, okay? Uh, what does that mean in terms of organisms? Well, I can't go through all the organisms. I just want to highlight three uh, and then maybe talk a little bit bigger in the bigger picture. One organism for the deeper changes that we're worried about are, are deep water corals. Did you know that the, these cold water corals, they exist in cold waters and they're not in the surface ocean, they're out of the, the, the lighted surface area. Uh, they can live down to a thousand meters in cold waters and they're very extensive. Here's a very, the most extensive cold water coral system, uh, much larger than the Great, Great Barrier Reef, uh, extending from Scandinavia all the way down uh, through Europe and, and into Africa. This is, this is the dominant coral, Lophelia pertusa. It's a stony coral. Uh, it lays down also this aragonite skeleton, so it's very important, not only for its living skeleton, but everything it's sitting on is old, dead coral. So, uh, that's also important if the waters then, if this saturation horizon is rising, these waters become undersaturated with respect to uh, 
uh, aragonite, then that means that the waters would be corrosive, chemically speaking, to these corals. And indeed, if we look at the, the model simulations and we, looking at the coral positions for all these corals, we find that, that now about 95% of all these corals in waters that are super saturated, that are bathed in waters that are not corrosive to the skeletons, but that will change by 2100 so that only about a third of the corals uh, will actually uh, be in waters that are not. Uh, a third of the corals you know, will maintain this, this um, the waters that are not corrosive to the skeletons. So two thirds will be exposed to corrosive waters. Okay, uh, here's another organism that exists, particularly important in the high latitudes, Limosina helicina. It's about the size of a, a little button or a lentil bean. Uh, it's, it lives in the surface ocean. Uh, these are found throughout the ocean, but this is particularly prominent in the high latitudes. It's found both in the southern ocean and in the Arctic Ocean. This is the same organism, Limosina helicina. Uh, it's kind of a bipolar organism, you could call it. Uh, and uh, in any case, what happens when we take this organisms? Uh, these are these are just nice images of a dead shell was was kind of dipped in. Oh gosh, it was dipped in into the water that we conditions that we expect for in the, in the end of the century. Uh, and you can see there immediate corrosion, uh, evidence of corrosion. The shell becomes cloudy and degraded after two weeks. Uh, it also happens for live organisms. Uh, so this is another. Cute little organisms, somehow people get attached to these sea butterflies or pteropods. Uh, other kinds of organisms, uh, I've talked about warm water tropical corals, cold water corals, but also these pteropods. But they're, you know, these are just organisms somehow involved with, with a aragonite uh, exoskeleton or skeletal material laying down. But there are many other organisms that are being studied now and many different manipulative techniques are being used to study these, uh, the effects of acidification on marine organisms, laboratory perturbation experiments, field observations uh, that are actually natural, uh, where, where you go out where there's actually CO2 being emitted near volcanoes such as in the Bay of Naples at Ischia. Uh, and you can, so the water is naturally lower in pH and has been for centuries. And so there's actually a gradient between where the CO2 is being emitted from the sediment, a gradient in pH, a change in pH from, from these more acidic conditions, something we would expect for 2100 or beyond, to natural conditions, uh, more like the, the open ocean. And so we can look at gradients of organisms across, across these, these pH gradients, just natural. And the nice thing about those, those are long-term experiments. Mesocosm experiments are these giant, they could be giant test tubes, if you will, that are put in, into the water column or, or some kind of uh, systems that are maintained at higher CO2 for extended period on the sediments. There's also the equivalent of what Lohan Bob showed as the phase experiments, the free atmosphere uh, carbon enrichment experiments, but for the ocean, the FOS experiments. Uh, those are just starting up and uh, they can be put around, for instance, corals and CO2 can be elevated for extended periods of time as well to look at these kinds of things. But there's an awful lot of data already uh, in this field. In fact, here's, if you just look at the research that's been done, ocean acidification really wasn't a term that was used until about 2005. Uh, and, and now this is the number of papers. It's growing exponentially in the number of authors that are being involved in these papers. It's doubling every two or three years. So, so it's becoming unmanageable. It's become, we cannot read all the papers that are coming out, at least not everyone can. There's a couple coming out every day. Uh, and they're not all easy to read, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, so ocean acidification has, uh, is, is definitely a growing field. There, it's been rated the number one research front in ecological and environmental sciences last year. Uh, on Thomson Reuters' web of knowledge because of such its growth, because of what's being done. Uh, so this has to be some way to get, a, get around some of this data. There's so much data now being produced with these manipulative experiments to actually treat and understand um, what's, what, uh, what it all means, okay? Because organisms are not always giving the same response, even if we look at a particular organism, depending on the, the treatments uh, that is being given, it can give quite different responses. So, so what's being done um, now is what people call meta-analyses, where they take a, uh, statistical approach to look at the data and try and estimate. Uh, this allows uh, biologists to actually estimate what trends are robust, what's the variability among certain types of experiments, certain types of organisms. And when this is done, 
we can, this in parentheses here are the number of publications that were analyzed for each of these factors. Uh, survival as a function of a pH change. pH changes in this study of less than 0.5 pH unit, uh, which is, seems quite a lot. It's, some, it's, it's on the order of what this 170% of what we would expect by the end of the century. Uh, but some of these studies were less than that. In any case, so in parentheses of the number of publications that were analyzed for each of these factors, survival, calcification, growth, photosynthesis, uh, development, abundance, metabolism, in terms of what is the effect of acidification on these different factors. And, and all the red circles show a significant uh, reductions in survival, reduced survival because of acidification, reduced calcification on many different organisms, reduced growth, uh, also reduced development, abundance. For photosynthesis, the trend, uh, one can imagine with more CO2 in the water, the, if if, like on land, that CO2 uh, is a CO2 fertilization, uh, you would, might expect that that would have an effect. But, well, there are some organisms that show this and, and others that don't. But in any case, there's no overall trend uh, of, of positive or negative in terms of photosynthesis. So definitely acidification has, has an, over, a large-scale effect on, on many different organisms. When, when that's broken down into the different organisms, it becomes more complex. And if we look at, for instance, uh, corals here or calcifying algae, uh, which are often associated with coral reefs, we can uh, see some obvious things in terms of calcification, the amount, the rate at which uh, corals lay down their skeletal material made of aragonite, uh, the abundance of corals. There's, these are red. This means not good, really bad. <laughs> uh, yellow, really no statistical effect, statistically nothing detected. Uh, reduce would be more of a pink. So we see some red, certainly uh, for some organisms, There's, particularly for mussels, oysters, um, mollusks in general. Uh, and other things, sea grasses, well, some show actually increased photosynthesis, but not a statistically significant trend. Uh, and so the story is not simple, right? Not all organisms will be affected by acidification in the short term. But, but uh, if you look at another study, interesting study was published uh, fairly recently in Nature Climate Change and was also summarized nicely in the latest IPCC report from Working Group 2. Uh, they show basically a, a, meta, a type of meta-analysis for pre-industrial, looking at different organisms for several cases. You could think of pre-industrial control, uh, two times CO2, the second bar, three times CO2, and four times CO2, roughly speaking. And there definitely is an effect on, on corals, as, as we'd seen in the other study, on echinoderms, this, another starfish or other echinoderms, on mussels, definitely. Uh, crustaceans, at very high levels of CO2, we see some kinds of effect, which the previous study did not indicate. Uh, different techniques, though. Fish, even. Fish, imagine that. Fish, why fish? Because uh, there are behavioral there are indications that fish actually uh, behave strangely at high CO2, being less fearful of predators, venturing further from their reefs. There was some famous study of a, of a clownfish, Nemo, uh, <laughs> showing, showing these uh, kinds of effects. And there have been other studies since. So even fish can be affected by acidification directly. Uh, and of course, if fish or other organisms feed on prey that are, that are actually uh, affected by acidification, then there will be a loss of prey. And that, if, unless they can switch to other prey easily, then that could also affect them. Um, so organisms, they react differently. Uh, there's a general consensus, definitely the corals and shell builders, there's a decline and due to acidification. Seagrasses may increase but there's really no statistically significant uh, sign that it's, it's happening, would be happening everywhere. Uh, fish become disoriented, predators affected by prey loss. Fish, fish catch, well, the research is just beginning. A modeling studies such suggest there may well be some effect on fisheries, but it's early days. This is, this is I just want to throw this up for an example of, of these natural CO2 vent systems where CO2 is bubbling out of the seafloor from, in this case, uh, here in the Bay of Naples. Uh, do, it's not near to Mount Vesuvius. And it's pure CO2. There's nothing else. And it's coming out. The, sea, the pH of the seawater is lower. The, you see lush fields of seagrasses here uh, across the gradient. And, but you also see 
many negative effects, less biodiversity, so fewer organisms, fewer calcifiers, uh, shell materials, much more fragile, paper thin shells for things like limpets and other organisms. So the protective ability of shells, for instance, would be much lower in such conditions. Uh, and we also see more invasive species coming from uh, outs outside areas. Uh, so, so it's quite an interesting study. These kinds of sites are, are more than just in the Bay of Naples. There are some also in the Pacific uh, Ocean that are being studied. Quite promising. This is one of the few ways to actually get at long-term effects. Even though there are drawbacks with these studies, there's a lot of variability uh, in these regions. But uh, it's nice to have this elevated CO2 level over probably centuries and we can see the effect. And by transplanting organisms inside and outside of these high CO2 natural, naturally enriched areas, we can see effects uh, also. So there's a lot of nice perturbation studies that can be done by the biologists with this. Of course, acidification also will affect us if it's affecting ecosystems and we're eating seafood, uh, there's no doubt, will have an effect on, on us. Fit, on our economy uh, and just on our, our health. Many fish is the primary source of protein for a billion people in the world today. Uh, coral reefs, of course, they're home for millions of species. About one fourth of the fish species that exist pass part of their time, spend part of their time on coral reefs. Uh, coral reefs are also uh, provide storm protection. Uh, they provide income from tourism, biodiversity, legacy for the future, for medicines, for instance. Uh, ocean acidification has already hit some areas of aquaculture, the oyster industry in the, in the U.S. West Coast. Some oyster, uh, fish, oyster hatcheries have moved from the West Coast where there's, there's seasonal upwelling of CO2 enriched waters that are they kind of worsen in terms of acidification because of the invasion of CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, they've already moved. They've gone to Hawaii. Maybe there's other reasons to go to Hawaii, but yeah, they had to move uh, in some cases. And, or they've learned to deal with these, these uh, occasional um, uh, occurrences, uh, shutting off the water supply when that happens, for instance. Uh, and we know that it will probably affect acidification, will affect aquaculture, fisheries, uh, and our livelihoods, we don't really have very good numbers yet on, on the economics of it, but this is starting to be studied. Um, it's not happening in isolation, though. The ocean is also warming. We've heard about oxygen. Oxygen is also changing in the ocean, so there are multiple stressors on the system, and we have to try and understand those in ocean acidification itself. I've shown this plot already, but I just want to point out that there's a huge, there's a huge range between the CO2 uh, that will be emitted, that can be emitted, and we, we have a lot to say in that. We have a lot, we can, we can affect that greatly. Here is an example of the different RCP scenarios, which will have a great effect on the pH. So there's hope there, and then certainly we need to instill hope, especially into the younger generations that are learning from you, uh, so something can be done about it. Uh, here's a very nice diagram from Ken Caldera, kind of just maybe in, in some ways a vicious circle where we see just human, humans do have this natural desire to improve our condition for well-being. But typically nowadays in particular that, that involves consuming goods and services, which involves consuming energy, and typically that energy is fossil fuel energy, so CO2 involves CO2 emissions, which then in turn increase atmospheric CO2, causing climate change, impacting, impacting us, impacting ecosystems, and then obviously reducing our well-being in, in, uh, in the long term at least. These little blue hammers, if you will, are some ways to break these links or at least to reduce the direct uh, link by m different processes, of course, by conserving, by perhaps not consuming as many goods and services, or using different goods and services, by if making our consumption more efficient, by using low carbon emission energy technologies, uh, by CO2 removal from the atmosphere. Uh, here's one which is being proposed to reduce the climate effect, more on that in a moment, uh, by would also well, if we can't do some of these things, we'd also have to try to adapt. We will have to have, adapt to some degree, but more or less. Uh, 
if we look at some of these CO2 removal techniques, I don't think I have time to go into these. Uh, none of them, well, only one of them is really so controversial, this iron, idea of adding iron to the ocean uh, because it would cause unknown consequences on marine organisms, but the ocean is largely iron deplete in, in high latitude areas, for instance, and we could increase CO2 uptake by that, but long-term increase is probably uh, difficult to estimate, and we would never be able to stop adding iron. These other approaches, well, I can, I can give you the reference and let you read those. It's more of an economic uh, issue than anything else. It would be on a local point scale. None of them would be a full solution in any case. This solar radiation management just probably needs to be mentioned that it's a climate change issue. It's not an issue. It won't have anything to do really with ocean acidification. It's not a fix for ocean acidification. It's something which uh, you, we could reflect more solar radiation by various means back to space, uh, but it won't have an effect on the CO2. If the CO2 continues to increase, then, then that, that will cause acidification. So actually, it could exacerbate worse than ocean acidification because if we would reduce climate change effect and, not, and continue to emit CO2, acidification would actually get worse. So uncertainty is kind of pointed out to the chemistry is quite certain. The biology is less certain. As we move into socioeconomic effects and trying to set policy for how to deal with this, uh, we have very low uncertainty. Uh, so there's a lot of information out there. You have some brochures already, but there's a tremendous amount of, of information. There's some very a nice film made by school children in England in many different languages, English, French, uh, among, among them. Uh, there's an award-winning movie, which has won awards with uh, festivals for other adult-made movies. This is another award-winning movie on ocean acidification. There's many different brochures. Uh, there is also a nice uh, blog or a news stream on ocean acidification every day with new information coming out, mostly uh, intended for scientists, but uh, there's also all kinds of general information coming out. Uh, more resources which you can refer to, I think you've, you find them in, in here already. Uh, the Ocean, OAICC webpage, the International Coordination Center for Ocean Acidification, one of the brochures you have here. Uh, the news stream, which I just mentioned, and also there's a nice site recently come up, ocean-acidification.net. So, thank you. <laughs>